music, and I didn't come through with a song, so that was awesome. Thank you guys for that. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon. It is such a pleasure to be here um, and to be hosting uh, this wonderful conference yet again. Um, and before I get started, I also just want to give a big shout out to my colleague, Beth Sturgeon, who has been doing yeoman's work putting on this conference. So let's give Beth a huge round. Beth is back there. And you know, in addition to, as Lisanne was talking about, uh, her day job where Beth does incredible work on our real estate sustainability team, she has been working nights and weekends to help put this on. So Beth, thank you for all that you do. All right, so I wanted to begin uh, by telling you a little bit about a topic that I'm really passionate about. And I talked a little bit about this last year, too, if you were here. Um, this topic of a circular economy. And the reason that I am really passionate about this topic is that I think that the model that we have had during the 20th century, since the Industrial Revolution, this take, make, dispose model, um, is really not going to serve us in the, 20th, in the 21st century. This is not a model for sustainable growth. And you know, some of the stats that, that really kind of hit this home for me are, one, in the 20th century, global raw material use rose at twice the rate of population growth. And today, here in 2017, August 2nd marked a really important day. This is Earth Overshoot Day. And basically what that means is every day since August 2nd, we have been operating in an ecological deficit. We've been drawing down local resource stocks. We've been emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that can't be absorbed. So essentially, we need 1.7 Earths to support our current demand. And that's in 2017. If we look forward to 2030, the World Economic Forum predicts that we'll have 3 billion new middle class consumers at that time. And so I think we need a new approach. And the circular economy, I think, offers us a roadmap for how we get there. So a circular economy is one where systems are designed to work. They eliminate pollution and waste. A circular economy is one in which assets are kept at their highest value for as long as possible. And it's one where materials can be cycled back into the economy so that it is restorative and regenerative. And for me, just on a personal level, I think the reason that this model makes so much sense is I was lucky enough to uh, grow up not far from here, up north of San Francisco, in a really small town on the beach called Muir Beach, surrounded by national and state park land. And I really got to grow up outside, swimming in the ocean and hiking in the hills. Um, and I think nature is truly our best guide for what it truly looks like to be restorative and regenerative. You know, we have 3.8 billion years of R&D in nature to point us to how we can make this transition. So what is a circular city? So one of the reasons why I think looking at circular economy at a city scale is really powerful is because today, 54% of the global population live in urban centers. Cities are uh, responsible for about 50% of global waste generation and 60 to 80% of emissions. So really significant if we can start to accelerate this transition into cities. So a circular city to me would be one in which we have a built environment that is designed to be incredibly <coughs> flexible and modular. And that it includes healthy materials, that there's nothing toxic in there. And that it is designed for disassembly and reuse. So you could have a structure and ultimately take it apart and reuse those parts in a second life. It would be one in which we have energy systems that are resilient, efficient and clean. It would be a city in which we have transportation systems that work, that get us where we need to go in a multimodal way, and that reduce pollution and congestion. And it would be one where our food systems are taking advantage of the bio cycle, bringing nutrients back into the system, and truly designing out waste. And I think there's a huge role for technology to play in driving this transition. And we recently published a paper with a partner organization of ours, you may be familiar with, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They're um, a great NGO out in the UK. And so we put out this paper with them to really try and investigate what is the potential role of technology in driving this circular city. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of both products that at Google we've developed and brought to market that can be a part of this transition, but also things we're experimenting with in our own operations. Sometimes we like to use our own operations as a test bed to really see what's possible. So first, uh, to think about, I talked about the built environment, the key role the built environment is gonna play. 
And so an aspect of that is healthy materials. You know, as we know, there's actually still a lot of kind of nasty stuff that ends up in our built environment, formaldehyde, PVC, and we need tools to help us figure out how do we bring the healthiest materials into our spaces. And so we actually have some people in the room today from our Google real estate team, but they have been working for several years with a great partner called the Healthy Building Network to build this tool called Portico. And basically, at essence, what Portico enables building project teams to do is to get more information about what's in stuff, paint, carpet, furniture, you name it, and then to make better decisions about what we're bringing into our built environment. And so we uh, brought several partners into this work last year, Harvard, Durst, Perkins and Will, and others. And our next goal is to make this a tool that's accessible to everyone. And solar, renewable energy, a key part of our circular cities of the future. And one challenge that we identified was that, you know, it can be actually really hard for homeowners to figure out, is my roof good for solar? What are, who are the solar developers in our, my area? So we developed this tool called Project Sunroof a couple of years ago. Um, and what Sunroof enables you to do is you can type in your address, and then you can see, is your roof a good candidate for solar? We've taken the smarts of 3D imagery from Google Earth and given really easy, actual information. How much money could you save, and also who are the solar developers in your area? And Sunroof also has a community scale tool called our Data Explorer. So it enables an entire community to assess what their solar potential is and to see where solar actually already exists. So this tool is now available in all 50 US states and in Germany, and it's being used by about 2 million people. So we're pretty excited about it. Now, Waze. A lot of you are probably familiar with Waze. I know I used it to get here today. You can be my as well. Uh, so Waze, of course, is uh, an app that enables us to share data to get where we want to go faster uh, and more efficiently. But also, Waze has a really great program where they're working directly with cities to use data to do better city planning. This is called the Connected Citizens Program. So we're now working with hundreds of cities around the world to share information so they can do better traffic light planning, infrastructure planning. Um, and a really cool example is in the lead up to the Olympic Games that took place in Brazil a couple years ago, Waze partnered with Brazil to prepare for one of the biggest traffic events in the world. And it was incredibly successful. Now, also, of course, a big piece of thinking about the future of transportation is air quality. And we have a great partnership with the Environmental Defense Fund and a great uh, women-owned company here in the Bay Area, Aclima, who make air quality sensors. And so we have our street view cars, which you can see in this slide. You probably see them driving around here in the valley. Um, and these are the cars that have the kit on top. They create Google Maps. But also, a few of them, we've been experimenting with adding air quality sensors. So these sensors can sense NOx, SOx, particulate matter, CO2, methane. And we can then take that data and make it available to communities. So we released our first data set uh, for the city of Oakland, just across the bay, over the summertime. And you're able to see, at a really granular level, how air quality is being impacted within a community. And we hope that this can be really actionable data. And Nest. Some of you may have a Nest learning thermostat in your home. This is a very simple tool that we can use to bring greater energy efficiency into our home. So the Nest Learning Thermostat uses machine learning to optimize heating and cooling in a home, and generally can save about 10 to 15% on a utility bill here in the US. And since we started deploying these uh, in 2011, Nest has saved about 3 billion kilowatt hours of energy, which is really significant. That's about what it would take to power 20 million refrigerators for a year. And then food waste. So again, this is a place where we really think technology can take us to the next level. Food waste is a huge issue globally. And so we've been experimenting in our own kitchens here at Google with how do we reduce food waste. And so we've partnered with a company based up in Oregon called Lean Path. And they have what you can see here in the slide, a system that we've brought into our kitchens. It's a scale with a camera. And we can use it after a meal service to weigh the waste, to understand what's getting wasted, what's expiring, and make smarter decisions. And since we have started deploying this tool in, in over 100 kitchens now around the world in 2014, um, during the course of the program, we've saved about 3 million pounds of food waste. So a really powerful tool. And so I just wanted to close by saying, um, you know, I, I think that we see these major emerging trends of the digital technology, the circular economy, and the movement to cities. You know, I talked about 
the percentage of the population that lives in cities today. By 2050, it's predicted that 75% of people in the world will live in cities. So I feel really excited about both the role of digital technology um, as well as the circular economy in really driving to a very positive, hopeful vision of the cities of the future. So thank you guys so much for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you.